Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Patriots History of the United States. I'm Larry Swikart, co-author of Patriots History with Michael Allen. We are now in our 41st printing. I've asked for an update. I have a feeling we're way past that now. Uh, we are in the 15th anniversary edition. However, if you want the 20th anniversary edition, email me at larry at wildworldofhistory.com, and I will send you the updated PDF with just the new chapter and about 20 pages of insertions of new research that I found in the last five years. All right. Um, remember, we have a full curriculum in U.S. and world history. Uh, these readings do not take the place of a curriculum. Obviously, I'm only up to chapter 11, uh, so we're not even halfway through the book yet, um, and it's taken us 155 lessons. So uh, we get through Patriots History of the United States. We get through the entire history course in one year, Columbus to Trump. Um, all lessons are uh, including videos, include videos. Uh, with me teaching every chapter in high production video. It's all digital, all downloaded, no license to expire. It's all yours as long as you want it. We're outside of our convention pricing now, but I'll tell you what, just between us, I won't tell my team about this. If you email me at larry at wildworldhistory.com, say, I just bought your curriculum or I intend to buy your curriculum, how much of a rebate will you give me? We'll talk. I'll make you a deal. Make an offer you can't refuse, right? Okay, so let's get started now. We are in Chapter 11, Lighting Out for the Territories. As always, I am using the 15th Anniversary Edition. If you use much earlier editions, the pages won't line up and some of the headers won't line up. Civilizing a Wilderness. Young Samuel Clemens, alias Mark Twain, gave up his brief career as a Mississippi steamboat pilot in 1861 sending out for the Nevada Territory aboard a stagecoach. Having tried his hand at gold and silver mining, he turned to newspaper work and a promising career as a writer. Clemens, in fact, moved to escape the Civil War, a conflict which, a conflict which he had served briefly and without distinction as a Confederate militiaman. He had no appetite for the kind of violence and devastation that consumed his fellow Missourians, like he, his later literary character, Huckleberry Finn, Sam Clemens, quote, lit out for the territories. Many had gone before him and many more followed. The period of manifest destiny followed quickly by the Mormon exodus and the California gold rush of 1849 set the stage for half a century of migration by Eastern Americans into and across the Great Plains. Clemens was preceded by tens of thousands of anonymous fur trappers, cowboys, prostitutes, loggers, fishermen, farmers, miners, teachers, entertainers, soldiers, government officials, and business entrepreneurs, in addition to Mormons, Jesuits, Methodists, and others missionaries. In the 1860s, while the Civil War raged back east, Clemens and a whole new generation headed west. In 1893, historian Frederick Jackson Turner wrote that this generation had succeeded so well that the American frontier had at last come to an end. In his brilliant essay, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, Turner traced the course of the westward movement from revolutionary times across the Appalachians and, to the, uh, and the Mississippi River. He pointed to the 1890 census report stating matter-of-factly that Western America had achieved a density of population that rendered the term frontier inapplicable. Turner undoubtedly portrayed America's Western experience as unique, but how was Turner's thesis right? Turner used the 1890 census report as a watershed to address the impact of the frontier experience on the American people. He rejected the idea that Europeans had molded American culture and argued that it was an American frontier experience that had created a unique American civilization, providing a safety valve for the release of societal pressures. <clears throat> he ascribed to the West and Westerners specific character traits, most of them positive and some unsavory, arguing that the West made Americans democratic, egalitarian, nationalistic, pragmatic, and adaptive, Turner also contended that the frontier life made them coarse, violent, anti-intellectual, and wasteful of natural resources. 
Yet even as he wrote, lumbermen like Frederick Weyerhaeuser, railroaders like James J. Hill, meat packers like Gustavus Swift began taking extraordinary measures to preserve the environment. And where Turner saw a violent, often barbaric West, the so-called Wild West may have been less violent in many respects than modern society. Most Western men were neither John Wayne types looking for a fight nor helpless citizens waiting for a frontier hero to rescue them. In regions where judges rode a circuit and came to town with any luck once a month, there naturally existed a tendency to take law into one's own hands. Where every animal had its claw, tooth, horn, or sting, many of them potentially fatal, and where every human had an incentive to jump a claim, steal livestock, or become offended, at the slightest insult, a necessary violence went with the territory. Nor was the West a Marxist model of class struggle for every saloon brawl that started over class interests, 50 began over simple insults or alcohol. On the other hand, frontier individualism was not ubiquitous and Westerners could cooperate when necessary. Towns first united to bring the cattlemen in, then passed laws to keep them out. Then cattlemen joined the townspeople to keep the sheepmen out. Then ranchers and farmers of all types sought to keep heavy industry out. Nor were these patterns unique. A century later, it was the same story. Heavy industry sought to keep computers and electronics out. Those who settled the West for better and occasionally for worse tamed a wild frontier. They left a legacy of romantic accomplishment that even to the present contains important messages and images for Americans. So as in keeping with my reading here, I am not going to read through the timeline. You can do that for yourself. <clears throat> Wagon trains, stagecoaches, and steamboats. Before the completion of North America's first transcontinental railroad in 1869, westbound pioneers continued to use a varied means of transport. Thousands drove wagons over well-worn, often muddy trails and helped break in some new ones. An era of private road building in the early eastern frontier areas gave way to a willingness to use the state and national government to improve transportation. Pony Express riders and horsemen traversed the trails and travelers booked passage on stagecoaches. Members of the famed Morgan, Mormon, sorry, Mormon handcart brigades literally walked the trail west, pulling their belongings behind them or pushing them ahead of them. Meanwhile, sailboats and steam-powered ocean vessels brought immigrants to the west via the coast of South America, and hard-working steamboats navigated the rivers. Decades after the coming of the railroad, nearly all of the above routes and means of transport endured in one form or another. Although settlers in the 1860s still used muskets, increasingly the Kentucky long rifle came into use, extending range and accuracy. After the Civil War, breech-loading Sharps, Spencer, Winchester, and Remington rifles with repeating action were available. The first repeaters appeared in the Civil War, and with minimal practice, a man or woman could squeeze off a dozen shots in less than 30 seconds. Remember, this is not always good. Because unless you're trained and can hit what you aim at, you tend to waste a lot of very expensive ammunition, ammo in the form of actual bullets, what we would call bullets today, cartridges, uh, was extremely expensive for this, nothing like the musket ball. Many men carried sidearms, usually a Colt revolver, knives, tomahawks, or other weapons were always handy in case of snakes or predators. When combined with circled wagons for defense, settlers had a good chance of warding off Indian attacks with such weapons. By the way, the same thing was true in South Africa. The Boers learned that in their trek into Zulu territory, if they formed their wagons into what was called a logger or a circle where they were interconnected, turned over and interconnected, they basically had a mobile fort. And the Zulus, uh, armed only with spears, had great difficulty breaching that. Same thing with American Indians on the frontier. The route north of the North Platte River became the Mormon Trail, blazed by the Mormons' exodus to Utah 1846 and 47. Army engineers built or improved upon additional trails throughout the west, such as the Bozeman Trail, a supply route stretching north from Fort Laramie in present-day Wyoming to the Montana country. In Washington Territory, the Army built the 624-mile Mullen Road, 
named for its surveyor, Lieutenant John Mullen, between 1659 and 62. Connecting Fort Benton, the head of the Missouri River Steamboat Navigation, to Fort Walla Walla, near the navigable Lower Columbia River, the Mullen Road was cut by the Army in order to transport troops and supplies. Soon, however, hundreds of miners, missionaries, entrepreneurs, and farmer immigrants cluttered, to the, cluttered the trail, turning it into a vital route for the 1860s gold seekers bound for the mines in the present-day states of Washington, Idaho, and western Montana. <clears throat> Stagecoaches were vital common carriers, commercial transporters, and mail freight and passengers. Like many Western businesses, stagecoach companies began small and then earned enough capital to become larger firms. Eastern coach companies began by Henry Wells, who ran a string of speech therapy schools in New York. John Butterfield and William Fargo became the basis of famous modern firms, American Express and Wells Fargo. The Butterfield line opened its southern route beginning through Texas, running through Texas to California in 1857. In 1860, the California Stage Company ran the 700-mile route between Portland, Oregon, and Sacramento, California, in an impressive six days. Beginning in 1852, Wells Fargo and Company, California Stage's famed competitor, offered service out of San Francisco to most of the West mining districts. In 1862, Ben Holliday, the stagecoach king, briefly challenged Wells and Fargo before selling out to them in 1866 and then founded the Oregon Central Railroad. For a brief moment between the stagecoaches and the telegraph, the Pony Express filled the gap for rapid delivery of mail. The uh, Pony Express, it's not the book, the Pony Express was um, founded by a visionary who had read a lot on the Chinese mail delivery system using light riders. And so they, um, they set up all of these stations between uh, St. Joseph, Missouri, and Sacramento. And stations were spaced every so many miles apart. Can't remember if it was 100 or what, but there were a number of these stations. Each one, of course, had a corral with a number of horses, fresh horses in it. Uh, contrary to what you might think, the Pony Express did not involve one rider starting in St. Joseph and riding all the way to Sacramento. They ran in loops. So you'd ride from St. Joseph 100 miles out, then come back. You pass the satchel off, the mailbag, the same way uh, runners pass off a baton in a relay race. And they got so good that they wouldn't stop their horses. As soon as the one rider got close enough to the station, a bugler would alert the next rider, have the horse ready. And when they were almost ready to meet, the one rider would start his horse off and the other guy would come riding alongside and flip him the mailbag. Now, these mailbags, or mochilas as they were called, M-O-C-H-I-L-A, had four bags. One, two, three, four. One front, right, front, left, back, right, back, left. <clears throat> and an empty space where you swung it over the saddle. Literally, these riders got so good that the incoming rider could get his mocha, uh, uh, mochila off without breaking stride of his horse. He'd swing one leg out, unhook it, get back in, swing the other leg out and unhook it, hand it off as he got close to the new rider. That rider would swing one leg out, throw it over, put his foot back in, swing the other leg out, put it over, continue on. So they never stopped. They never broke stride. And the rider who just arrived would sleep, get a fresh horse and head back in the morning with a new pouch of mail that was coming from the other direction. Now, the key to all of this was that the letters had to be extremely light. They charged you, as I recall, a dollar for a letter. And then there were extra charges if it weighed so much as an ounce more. So what the Pony Express encouraged you to do was use their own envelopes. And you would write your message inside the envelope. And the envelope would be folded four ways and sealed. So when you open the envelope, you opened your letter. There was no letter inside. There was just the envelope. Now, of course, some people did it 
the old fashioned way. And of course, whenever possible, the US post office got its grubby mitts involved and insisted that you use uh, regular post office envelopes that were stamped. So people pay for a stamp, put a stamp on and put that inside of a Pony Express envelope. Same way for a while you had to put a envelope inside a FedEx pack, right? Or an envelope. Anyway, <clears throat> we have some early images of um, President Lincoln's election announced by Federal Express letter and a message is that Lincoln himself sent by Pony Express. Did I say Federal Express? Pony Express. Um, one of the keys to keeping things light was that um, weight was an absolute problem. You wanted the lightest possible rider. So I'm sorry, there were no fatties. There were no plus size Pony Express riders. You'd kill the horse, right? So they kept a very young riders and there was actually an ad written. I showed this up to my classes. It said wanted young, wiry fellas for Pony Express. Um, willing to risk death daily. That was actually on the ad. And then you'd go, why in the world would anybody do that? And then it gave the pay. I can't remember what the pay was. I think it was something like $20 a week, which would just be incredible. I mean, that'd be like several thousand dollars a week. Um, now, these riders carried no rifles. They only carried a pistol and a knife in case something happened with a snake or something along the way. But even after a while, they quit carrying pistols because they figured that being light was better than being armed. And it was better to outrun Indians than to try to outfight them. And initially, they had hoped that the riders would carry a bugle. And when they were within distance, sound their arrival with a bugle and, blah, 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 and the other guy get ready. But again, wait, they, they got rid of that. Now, one interesting thing was that the Pony Express recruited heavily from Mormons and sought Mormon riders because it was thought that the Ute Indians uh, had a good relationship with Mormons. Now, I don't know how they knew they were Mormon riders unless they were riding in twos and had white shirts and ties. I, I don't know, just a joke. Anyway, the Pony Express lasted for about a year. It was incredibly successful. And overnight, the Pony Express was put out of business when the telegraph was hooked up. After that, any quick messages you wanted to send could be sent by telegraph. Anything slower could go by stagecoach. So it's an interesting case study which I wrote up in a number of places as to what happened to all these riders. And what you found was that this army of unemployed, there are about a thousand of these guys who are unemployed, station hands, everybody, found not only good work elsewhere, but found very high paying work elsewhere. One of them opened a hotel in Albuquerque. Uh, one of them became head of the insurance a big insurance company branch in Los Angeles. Uh, many ended up working in rodeos as clowns or as riders. Um, so we could only find a record of one guy who was truly unemployed the rest of his life. And he was a loner who went off into the middle of nowhere to be left alone. So my point in the article was being unemployed is not a death sentence. Quite the contrary, you can turn your unemployment into a life sentence, but you have to be willing to change your focus, right? Um, one last thing. Whether it was Wells Fargo, which eventually merged, Butterfield, or Overland, the three biggest stagecoach manufacturers, they controlled non-railroad land traffic between Missouri and California. Okay. Yes, you could ride a horse, but most stuff was sent via Overland, Butterfield, or Wells Fargo. You know, if you had any kind of packages to send, gold or silver, which is why they're always trying to rob stages, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so those were your land transportation companies. Which one of them invented the automobile? Oh, none of them did? 
There's a guy who worked at Westinghouse named Henry Ford. I know there were some Europeans tinkering with it too. But basically, Henry Ford invented the automobile. So it didn't come from one of the leaders in the field in land transportation, right? How about this? You know, at the time of the Civil War, we had a lot of air balloons. We had a lot of balloon manufacturers. They were used for observation. I suppose if you wanted to, you could use them for transportation through the air. Which one of the balloon manufacturers invented the airplane? Oh, it wasn't a balloon manufacturer. It was a couple of brothers in Dayton, Ohio, who worked on bicycles. What, is bic what do bicycles have to do with the air? Okay, how about this one? Back in the day, and I know none of you will know this now, we used to have these long things that looked like a ruler. But it's really two rulers with a little slide on it. It was called a slide rule. That was the way you did intense calculations prior to having calculators and cell phones. Okay, Keffel was the main manufacturer of slide rules in America. So it was Keffel that introduced the computer calculator, right? No, it was Texas Instruments. In the 1990s, we had a listening device you put on headphones, and when you wanted to walk or jog, you carried this little black box with a cassette tape. You can look that up. That was put out by Sony. You might remember it was called a Walkman. Okay, so it was Sony that gave us digital music, right? No, it was a computer company, not a music company called Apple that gave us iTunes. My point is, the leader in the field almost never is in charge of the next big breakthrough. IBM controlled 85% of the world computer market, was not in charge of the personal computer. That would be Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. All right, we'll pick up next time with the Iron Horse, and I'll see you then.